elusive to us at this point and any sort of aspects of gravity we can understand in, in the quantum regime, I, I would argue are interesting for us to, to uh, as a target to go after. So as one of those, uh, one of those targets, um, so one of the activities we're doing uh, involves looking for fifth forces. And so if we uh, look at, let me see if my thing is working here for some reason, my slides are not advancing. Here we go. Okay. If we look at the, the standard model of particle physics, there is, are sort of four known forces of nature. Uh, and so if you look at, say, the relative strength of these forces for, for example, two protons inside of the nucleus of an atom, uh, you can uh, see a huge disparity in the relative strengths of the interaction. And so in particular, uh, if you normalize things so that the uh, electrostatic repulsion between the protons is one, then the gravitational interaction between them is about 36 orders of magnitude uh, smaller, which is really off scale. And so, so this leads us uh, to uh, a theoretical problem uh, known as the, the gauge hierarchy problem, uh, which is a challenge for us to explain why gravity is so small uh, compared to these other standard model uh, forces in nature. And so you could sort of cast this problem in a different way in terms of energy scales, if you like. So if you were to look at sort of the inferred energy scale of quantum gravity, uh, this would be something like 10 to the 19 uh, GeV. And then we have this electroweak physics scale that we study in accelerators that's more at the one TeV area. And then we have this uh, so-called desert of 16 orders of magnitude where there's really no uh, known physics uh, in between. And so as one uh, solution to this problem, uh, the most popular one, uh, people have proposed that there could be supersymmetry and it's still being looked for now at the, at the Large Hadron Collider. There have been other suggestions to how to resolve this, this large disparity of orders of magnitude, for example, uh, suggestions that there could be large extra spatial dimensions beyond the three that we uh, know and see around us. And in this sort of framework, then perhaps the true uh, energy scale for quantum gravity is not way up at 10 to the 19, but rather sort of more closer to the electroweak scale. And this apparent uh, high scale 10 to the 19 just comes from basically a weakness of gravity as it gets diluted from propagating into these extra uh, dimensions. And so both of these ideas, whether it's supersymmetry or perhaps large dimensions, point to the possibility that if you were to measure gravity at short distance, uh, you would see some uh, change below some characteristic length scale that would correspond to some new particle uh, being exchanged, for example. And so this characteristic scale in many theories tends to be kind of at the sub millimeter re regime. And so in this way, it's interesting to do measurements of gravity uh, at, at these sub millimeter ranges to look for these kind of effects here beyond the standard model, some of which may be related to uh, quantum gravity or to string theory, for example. And so the idea is then you can test the uh, Newtonian uh, one over R potential. If I have two masses separated by some distance R, I have the Newton constant describing the coupling. And then there's a term here I can look for where I have this exponential uh, correction to gravity where alpha here is some uh, dimensionless number that's just compared, uh, comparing the strength of the new physics to one, the strength of gravity. And then uh, lambda here is basically the Compton wavelength of a new particle that might exist to mediate this uh, short range interaction. And so, as I was mentioning, uh, things like supersymmetry and string theory kind of naturally give you predictions for kind of sub millimeter ranges on these type of forces, as well as some of these uh, large extra dimension models. And so to, uh, to really put this to the test though, we need extremely sensitive uh, force sensing devices because the gravitational interaction is really quite, quite weak. And so I can look at the kind of broader landscape for a moment for these kind of uh, corrections to gravity. And so this now is a plot again of this uh, exponential type uh, Yukawa sort of correction to the Newtonian potential. Now I'm showing a graph as a function of the length scale of the interaction lambda going all the way from kind of planetary scales down to sub uh, micron scales. And then this is this strength parameter dimensionless here relative uh, to, to gravitational strength at, at, at one here. So you can see at kind of uh, earth moon distances, they're really quite good uh, constraints on this one over R form of the potential here where we know at about a sort of part in 10 billion level, uh, the one over R potential holds pretty pretty well. However, you can see very quickly this uh, exponent flip sign. And if you're down at about a 10th of a micron, now you could have a, a, 
something about 10 billion times stronger than the force of gravity, but there'd be no experimental uh, limit that would otherwise prevent that from from being there. And so one of the big uh, one of the big challenges here has to do with just you know if I look at the way the gravitational force scales, if I take two uh, test masses say uh, that are spherical and uh, bring them as close together as possible at a distance of twice their radius, uh, I can plug in you know the fact that the, these masses are composed of some material with a finite density. And when I when I include the uh, um, all the geometrical factors, the Newtonian uh, potential, the Newtonian force between these two objects scales like the positive fourth power of the uh, size scale of the system. And so as I shrink this whole system down, then this force gets very weak uh, very rapidly. And so taking about as dense material as we can find uh, on Earth, which is about 20. Uh, grams per cubic centimeter. If you're sitting at a distance of about 10 microns, the forces involved here are something like 10 to the minus 21 newtons, or that's a zepto newton for those not familiar with the prefix. So, so this is quite quite a small uh, force that that one were one one's trying to try to measure here. At the same time, uh, there's an additional challenge because electromagnetic forces from things like the Casimir force and other sort of uh, backgrounds tend to get stronger when you get things smaller and closer together. In particular, um, the, the Casimir effect uh, is growing something like one over the fourth power of the of separation distance for say for two, two parallel plates. And so this is tending to get, to get, get stronger at short distance as well as we have other um, um, spurious kind of electrostatic backgrounds, for example, even good conductors uh, tend to have local work function variations over their surface, which can provide uh, local uh, uh, electrostatic uh, um, background uh, forces at, at short distance, which often can be much stronger than these gravitational signals that we're searching for. So if you look at kind of zooming in now on the laboratory scale uh, end of this, uh, we can show now the, uh, again, this uh, Yukawa type correction to the Newtonian potential now from 100 microns down to about 10 nanometers, so at the lab scale. So um, the blue, oh, sorry, the, the yellow area here is what's been ruled out by experiments so far, and some of the theoretical predictions from string theory or other extra dimensions theories are shown as these uh, green and, uh, and pink shaded bands over here on the left. So um, the best limit uh, at kind of uh, tens of microns comes from precision torsion balance experiments that are done at the University of Washington. Uh, a little bit shorter distance at around 10 microns. The best limits are from cryogenic cantilever experiments. This is an experiment I took part in for my PhD work. And at even shorter distances, the best limits come from Casimir precision Casimir measurements or adaptations of those uh, measurements uh, at this kind of micron scale uh, over here. And so all of these systems uh, involve some sort of force sensing or torque sensing element, whether it's a torsion pendulum or a micro oscillator or some torsional oscillator. So there's some sort of mechanical device here that's basically being used as a, as a, a force sensor. And these devices uh, tend to be limited uh, uh, by thermal, thermal motion, thermal noise. And so if you imagine the particle is sitting in some uh, heat bath at finite temperature, then the oscillator is getting kicked around due to that thermal energy. Uh, and if you write down the equipartition theorem uh, from StatMech, you can figure out that in the presence of those random thermal kicks on the, on the particle, there's a minimum force you can see on top of that background. So this minimum detectable force here, uh, F min, goes like the thermal energy uh, KT uh, times the spring constant and the bandwidth of the measurement uh, divided by the mechanical quality factor and the frequency of the oscillator. So um, as a way of improving the sensitivity here, one can try to get a very high uh, quality factor uh, oscillator. And so in these sort of solid state type experiments that I showed that are currently holding the world's best limits, they, they have limitations on the quality factor coming from things like clamping or surface imperfections or loss in the material and so forth. And so here is now where the uh, levitated optomechanics can play a role by basically suspending the particle, uh, polarizing it you, using a laser, you can create an optical potential and basically confine the particle at the focus of a laser or, or at the intensity uh, 
antinode and a standing wave of a, of, a, of a laser trap. And so now by studying the motion of that center or mass of the object, now we're relatively well decoupled from the environment, assuming we can get in a good vacuum. And then we're no longer uh, concerned with the clamping mechanism and the internal materials loss is not as relevant since we're only looking at the center of mass mode, which is largely decoupled from the phonons in the, in the material itself. And so with these kind of sensors, then you can do quite um, uh, good uh, force sensitivity in a, in a UHV environment, for example, at 10 to minus 10 tor at 300 Kelvin. This is a plot of the sensitivity for a nanosphere uh, as a function of size going from kind of 10 nanometers up to tens of microns. And so for micron scale objects and below, you can get into this regime of uh, 10 to the minus 21 uh, Newtons per Hertz, which is really in the interesting regime for these uh, gravitational type interactions at, at, at few micron distances. Um, so uh, here I'm plotting that same formula I had earlier, except now in terms of the mass and the gas uh, damping coefficient of the particle, there is a little deviation you have from this uh, straight line here from this formula. This is due to uh, the effects limits from, from photon recoil heating. So this is a quantum effect where the particle is basically kicked around in kind of a momentum diffusion process from a discrete scattering events of the trap laser uh, um, photons that are that are trapping it. And so, so this was seen um, um, recently in uh, by Lucas Novotny's group a few years ago in a nice paper here. Um, but already back in 2013, people have seen sensitivities here that are on the order of uh, tens of zeptonewtons per, per square root of hertz. And these, these cantilever type sensors, which were used for previous gravity measurements are a few orders of magnitude uh, worse in terms of sensitivity. So, so this is, I think, quite promising for ex exploring gravity at, at short distance. And so in our lab, uh, this doing an experiment, this is the cartoon version, uh, we have a optical standing wave in a cavity and we can trap a nanoparticle that's made of uh, silica in, in, a, in one of the antinodes of this standing wave next to a, a thin mirror. So in our case, we have a thin uh, mirror that's coated with gold. It's a silicon nitride membrane uh, behind, uh, sorry, was there a question out there? I heard something. I can't see the participant list. So I'm not sure if people are <laughs> raising hands or anything like that. But anyway, feel free to interrupt me if there's a question. Um, so here there's a, a gold a membrane. And then behind the membrane, we have a, a device that's used to source the gravitational signal. In our case, it's a it's sort of a, a, a almost looks like a piano keyboard where you have dark and light sections, where you, we have dense uh, gold material followed by less dense silicon material, and then that pattern alternates. So this device is sitting on an actuator, which can basically move it up and down. And when it moves, then the uh, gravitational force is modulated uh, that, that, uh, that interacts with this nanoparticle. The, uh, this mirror membrane here in between is serving both as the reflector for the optical trap, but also as, the, um, as a device to screen the, the Casimir interaction. So there'll be a very strong Casimir force generally between the particle and the surface, but this gravitational force, which depends on the density is occurring behind the screen. So the idea is that that can modulate the signal and provide a, a force that you can discern from the Casimir effect. And so given the sensitivity and the fact that you can get to within micron scale distances of the surface, uh, you we project that you should be able to get a few orders of magnitude improvement in this parameter space plot for new uh, tests of particles from string theory, for example, at this micron length scale, where we uh, anticipate something like three or four orders of magnitude uh, improvement uh, at, that, at that distance. So also the Casimir force can be looked at in this system um, where you, now we're studying the force between um, the particle and the mirror. Um, so there's kind of two regimes. There's a short distance regime uh, where you have this kind of sphere plate limit where you, things go like the third power of the separation distance and then there's sort of a longer distance uh, Casimir polar regime where the force goes like the fifth power, one over the fifth power. And so um, given the thermal noise limited sensitivity, you can measure a frequency shift as you uh, approach to a different distance from the surface, and um, you should be able to be able to measure something about the Casimir effect as well in the same uh, setup. 
Okay, so the experiment uh, looks a little bit more like this in, in practice. So we have uh, two counterpropagating beams that we're calling the dipole beams, where we initially catch one of these nanoparticles. Um, and then that dipole beam is actually overlapping with another trap that's in an optical cavity. This is where the gravitational measurements take place. So here we have the mirror uh, for that cavity. And then I have an additional set of lasers that we can use to do laser feedback cooling uh, of the center of mass motion of the particle. So the test mass in this gravity experiment is this 300 nanometer silica bead here. Uh, and so um, this is a picture of the actual inside of the chamber. We have the cavity beams in this axis. This initial trap, we collect the particle along the uh, 90 degrees. And then beyond this, we have our drive mass actuator with the, with the, um, the gravitational source mass mounted on the end of that. So the, this is a zoom in on the actual source mass that we're using. Um, so this, we, we fabricate it here by uh, basically etching uh, uh, trenches into a silicon wafer using standard uh, microfabrication techniques. And then we electroplate gold down into these trenches. Um, when we do that, we sort of have this corrugated surface in the top, which is not really ideal because we don't want to have any sort of modulation in the patch potentials or other sort of electromagnetic backgrounds that occurs with this kind of same period that we have the density modulation underneath the surface. And so after we create this uh, wafer here, we flip it upside down and mount it on a, on, a, on a substrate. And then we actually polish away the silicon here from the backside. So this is a picture on the right in the middle of that technique where we're doing a cross section cut to show the process. But so you can basically cut through the silicon and leave a flat surface at the top, uh, right above the gold teeth here, where it's just flat silicon that's about uh, one to two microns uh, thickness. To, so we don't uh, modulate the uh, electromagnetic background while we're modulating the gravitational background. Okay, so to load our particle uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the experiment, we use a, a device where we basically shake uh, these particles that are deposited on a glass substrate. It takes a fair amount of acceleration to knock these particles off the surface. So for example, at the size we're using the, for the test mass, it's 150 nanometer radius particle. Uh, the acceleration you need to shake the surface with is going like one over the square of the size to break the Van der Waals um, interaction between the, the particle and the substrate. And so we actually measure and, and, uh, and, and get accelerations on the order of 10 to the seven Gs to get these particles to come off. And so uh, if you do that, you can release them pretty reliably. If you tried to shake the thing much harder, we start to break things. And so it's really kind of at the close to the limit, I think, of, of what this method can do. But, but it seems to work pretty well. And so this is a picture of a, a quick movie, if you want to see, of an earlier setup we had where you can see the particles shaken down and then they, they kind of fall down. Here there's counter propagating beams that are, you're seeing some scattering off of windows here. Uh, the, and they form a focus here near the center uh, of, the, of the, where I have my pointer. And so here we get a particle that gets stuck in the trap. And then in this case, we have a few that kind of joined, joined the trap there. And so, um, so these particles are typically loaded with a few uh, tor of uh, background nitrogen. That's to kind of slow down and damp the motion and allow them to get collected in the trap. So this movie is actually real time. It's not uh, slowed down or anything. You can see the particles kind of gradually falling down to the right uh, here where gravity is pointing to the right since the image is tilted uh, 90 degrees here. And so um, we collect the particle um, and then we have to pump the air out. Uh, so we spent some time characterizing some instabilities that occur when we try to pump the air out uh, and lose the particle in many cases. So we think uh, many of those were uh, due to uh, radiometric forces where basically if the surface of the particle is heated by the laser, uh, it can create currents of the, of the nearby gas molecules. And those currents of the gas molecules can actually overcome the radiation pressure uh, force, which would otherwise hold the particle in the trap. And that's already been demonstrated in the 1800s here with, with Crookes radiometer, who thought he uh, discovered radiation pressure uh, a long time ago. But in fact, what he discovered here was the radiometric force. So here are lights shining on this thing that can spin inside this glass bulb. And it looks like it's basically pushing harder on the dark side of these paddles than on the bright, shiny side of these paddles. And so, so the, uh, it's actually spinning from the, the hot gas, uh, pushing against the, the heated dark surface as opposed to the radiation pressure, which would actually 
push more strongly on the bright reflective side. And so this, this clearly can dominate over the radiation pressure force. And in these optical trap experiments, it can cause uh, stabil instabilities uh, to, to occur. And so, so basically, if you have an uneven heating of the surface from the focusing profile of the laser, uh, you can create local uh, heat, uh, you know, temperature gradients, which can drive gas, gas currents and destabilize the particle. So this can be mitigated as our group and other groups have found using feedback cooling. So we do three dimensional feedback cooling uh, on the particle. We basically image the um, motion of the particle by collecting the scattered light onto a segmented uh, photo detector. That gives us a three dimensional, using two of these things, it gives us a three dimensional record of the position of the particle. Then we can take that position information, figure out the instantaneous velocity, and then feed back to some modulators on the cooling light to basically create a velocity dependent force in, in all three directions. And so this uh, allows us to cool and also damp the motion of the particle. So it brings back some of the damping in that the gas would have at, at higher pressure. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't hurt the sensitivity because uh, I've, although I'm dropping this Q factor, which which sounds bad for the force sensing. I'm also dropping the temperature by roughly the same amount. And so the sensitivity is largely unaffected by that method. So once you do that, you can go to high vacuum. So this is some demonstration we had earlier on uh, force sensing at this Zepto Newton le level, 10 to the minus 21 Newtons. Here where we're integrating down a measurement uh, over 100,000 seconds and showing that the experiment has no other background forces at that level. So we can actually do, in principle, uh, gravitational measurement at the level of Zepto Newtons in the system. And we calibrated that force sensitivity using uh, statics. So most of the time, the particles are neutral. But about 10% of the time, we get one or two electrons on here. So that's this uh, red and blue band. And so then if you have an electron, you can put a known um, electric field from some electrodes that we have in our cavity. And so well, then we can cross check the actual force on the, on the particle and make sure that we're measuring as small of a force as we think we are. So uh, at the moment, we're working on now characterizing the sensitivity as well as any systematic effects that come up when you keep the particle very close to the surface. So this is uh, work that's uh, in progress still here, but we can now develop a method where we can reliably position the particle at a certain antinode from the retroflected standing wave from the mirror. And so we, we're studying now at various pressures the force sensitivity and whether there's any systematic effects as I get down to a few microns and sort of from, from the surface. Uh, and so we're hoping to be able to, after characterizing this, have some preliminary measurements on gravity at the micron scale uh, within the next several months. Okay, so <clears throat> everything that we talked about there was kind of focused on quantum gravity in some way, if you like, but more sort of testing quantum gravity with a, with a classical instrument, right? Just a a ball uh, that's bouncing around inside the laser trap. And so I think it's interesting now to ask what you can do by taking the sensor itself into the quantum regime in terms of what you can do uh, with gravity or other, other tests. And so, so for, for individual atoms, uh, we've been in the quantum regime now for, for decades. Uh, so this was uh, acknowledgement in 2012, of the Nobel Prize with uh, Dave Weinland and Sir Tarosh for the impressive quantum control over individual atoms and ions. Uh, in, the, in the sort of solid state uh, optical mechanics community for about a decade now, we've been in the quantum regime, if you like. This is a remarkable result from 2010 where they cooled down something you can actually see with your eye. This is 60 microns here in the length scale. By putting it in a dilution fridge, they actually had the motion of this object in the quantum ground state. And then there were some laser cooling uh, demonstrations, and microwave sideband cooling demonstrations shortly after of real mechanical systems that are now vibrating in the in the ground state of their motion, and so this kind of shows the some of the progress over the over the past uh, couple of uh, a decade, couple of decades, where we've now gotten down to into the quantum regime. And, and in our community, uh, Marcus Asselmeyer uh, showed some uh, very exciting results in 2019, where now the levitated optomechanical systems using uh, cavity cooling can be now brought into the quantum. Uh, regime as well, and so um, in our in our group, we're we're also doing some experiments along this direction, although taking a slightly different approach. 
where we're combining uh, our, our work with uh, our work on laser cooled atoms in an attempt to use the atoms essentially to sympathetically cool the motion of the particle. And so this is an experiment that's ongoing where we have uh, rubidium atoms that are trapped in uh, optical lattice in one vacuum system. And in a second vacuum system, we have a nanoparticle that's held in a tweezer trap. It's a 170 nanometer diameter sphere in our case. And we're trying to now use an optical field essentially to have the two talk to each other where the hope would be that by cooling the atoms using the optical molasses, we can cool the motion of the particle in, in its separate chamber here where the particle is interacting through uh, assisted with it with an optical cavity here of a kind of a medium finesse about 350 or 400 or so. And so the basic physics of how that works, well, I'll get to in a second, but so to pre-stabilize the particle uh, in that system, we use parametric feedback cooling, uh, where, which is a technique that many other groups have been very successful uh, with, where we kind of get this temperature down to sort of tens of Kelvin to just sort of allow us to get into the higher vacuum uh, regime. And then uh, once we're in that regime, we can now study the interaction uh, between the atoms and the particle. And so the basic physics is something like this, where you, if you have the particle here in the tweezer trap, uh, it's sitting in on the mode of this uh, cavity here. If the particle moves a little bit, then the phase of the light uh, coming out of the cavity uh, changes a little bit. And that, that this same standing wave, which is in the cavity also collects the atoms in an optical lattice. And so if the phase change, then the position where the atom is trapped basically shifts a little bit and that puts a force on the atom. So there's a mechanical link basically between the motion of the particle and the motion of the atom. And similarly, if the atom moves away from its minimum, then there's a force that tries to confine the atom at the highest intensity part of the standing wave. And so microscopically, this amounts to a absorption and stimulated emission of photons but, but it amounts to a, a imbalance then of the left and right moving part of the standing wave in order to exert the force back on the atom to put it back in the center of the trap. So what that does is it modulates the intensity of the light coming in the cavity. And so therefore puts a force on the nanoparticle, which is sitting somewhere along the slope of the, of the cavity mode. And so this, in this way, there's a mechanical link. And so then if you can do kind of traditional laser cooling, optical molasses cooling of the atoms in the lattice, then in principle, we can cool the particle all the way down to the ground state from room temperature. And so, so that's uh, the, the goal of the experiment. The, the one potential thing is that it doesn't require a super high finesse cavity. And it also, it, uh, it involves the possibility of maybe looking at strong coupled interactions between the two cold atoms and the particle. So we're interested in, and continuing to explore that direction as well. But so uh, assuming we can cool at or near the ground state, then this opens up the possibility for experiments with um, uh, uh, um, precision sensing where now the particle is in the quantum regime and we're interested in particular in things like matter wave, uh, uh, matter wave ex interference experiments with these things. And so so going back to kind of the, the, the outline if you want for gravity and quantum mechanics, so, so we've, talked a little bit at the beginning about uh, looking at testing how gravity fits into quantum mechanics. So looking for effects from string theory, for example. Um, some other interesting things I think to look at uh, are in asking questions like how large of a thing can you see wave particle duality in? How large of a thing can you see a macroscopic quantum superposition in? And then also, can we look at the way gravity participates directly in entangling different quantum systems. And so um, in particular, with regard to the idea of the wave particle duality, um, I guess in this in maybe in the series you just heard, uh, I think a few weeks ago from uh, Marcus Arndt, who now has a record of the largest macromolecule now that's been able to diffract through a grating. And so you can really see macroscopic uh, superpositions of fairly large uh, molecules. And so it's interesting to see, can we extend this, I think, to these nanoparticles, if we can prepare a sufficiently cold source of nanoparticles, uh, can we really put something that's maybe a thousand times bigger than this into a quantum superposition? And so in particular, if we can, uh, we'd like to do an experiment um, that would potentially also allow us to make a sensor out of, out of a matter wave uh, 
basically a matter wave interferometer with the nanoparticles. And so the idea being here that you trap a particle uh, in, a, in a standing wave uh, near a surface and you cool it down using either a cavity or perhaps our atom cooling if we can get it to work well, then you would release the particle when it's in an ultra cold state, allow the wave packet to expand and then basically diffract it off of a grating, which is can be another, another laser standing wave, let it fall for some time and now measure the position. And so if in the course of the particle falling, it experiences an acceleration toward the surface, let's say from the Casimir effect or maybe from a gravitational effect, if you have some kind of a mass behind the surface, then, then that, that signal will, uh, will result in a change in the interference pattern of, uh, that would be produced if you were to measure where the particle is away from the surface. And so, so for example, if you did this experiment many, many times, you'd sort of build up an interference pattern one particle at a time. And the location of these fringes where the probability of the particle being is high would basically shift uh, if there was an acceleration on the system, for example, along the beam direction in this case, which would be would be toward the surface. And the acceleration sensitivity one can get here is quite impressive, you know, at the nano G kind of level, which is competitive with some of these other acceleration sensing things like based on atom interferometers, for example. But, th but this also would allow you to do a measurement in a very localized way uh, near, near a surface within micron scale distances. Assuming one could realize that, then it would be possible to uh, do these sort of uh, tests of for string theory related changes to gravity at short distance using the matter wave sensing. And so then I think that would allow you to cut a lot deeper even down into this parameter space at sort of a few micron level uh, using that uh, matter wave interference approach. So that's something we would like to think about eventually being able to do in the long run uh, if we can really get these experiments to, to, to take off. I think another really interesting thing that, um, that uh, several of us here at this meeting uh, uh, conceived of, including uh, Sugato and Anupam, uh, uh, is the, this idea of being able to enter into quantum superpositions with these nanoparticles really opens up the possibility of some interesting tests of how gravity uh, participates in entangling quantum systems. And so the idea here in, in the, the paper from a few years back would be to basically prepare two adjacent quantum superpositions of say, for example, nanoparticles, where you actually look at the gravitational interaction between the superpositions where now the source mass itself is in a quantum superposition. So this is kind of a, a, a nice uh, thought experiment at this point, and, and it'd be very interesting to see what we can do to make this an actual real experiment in, in the near future. But the idea is basically you prepare two superpositions here. In this case, we're using an additional degree of freedom, the spin to sort of keep track of the, of the system. So we split uh, each, each wave packet along, along two paths and study the uh, gravitational interaction for some holding time between one part of this superposition and the other part of that superposition. Then we recombine these and we can use this uh, spin basically as a way to measure the entanglement from that interaction. Um, so in, as a way to, to sort of um, develop techniques that might make this sort of matter wave experiments uh, more tractable in our group, one thing that we've been doing on the experimental side is trying to develop new ways of loading our particles uh, directly in high vacuum. So the idea is that if you're going to do interference experiments like the one I had uh, talked about where we try to measure surface forces, for example, as a starting point, Casimir forces using, uh, you know, macroscopic uh, superpositions. Uh, one thing one would might want to do would be to, if you're measuring interference patterns one particle at a time, it would be nice to collect and, and retrap either the same particle or quickly be able to retrap new particles when you're in a measurement condition of having a really high vacuum and not worry about you know, first collecting the particle at, at some lower, at some, you know, worse vacuum and then pumping the air out and so forth. And so we've been trying to develop ways of directly doing this. This also would mitigate some of these problems I mentioned before about the radiometric heating uh, that was limiting our, our efficiency and, and causing instabilities. And so as well as simplifying other aspects of the experiment, like for example, tuning feedback loops and that sort of thing based on the pressure. And so we've been doing some work now uh, where uh, we uh, basically have been studying the distribution of velocity of particles coming off of our, our particle. 
uh, off of our off of our um, substrate rather as, as it sort of falls through our, our trap for different sizes of particle and looking at sort of the terminal velocity and so forth as a function of pressure. And so we found some interesting effect here basically where um, uh, so uh, at ultra high vacuum uh, or, or as, as, we, as we start to pump out the air in the system rather, we're kind of following the curve reasonably well for terminal velocity, which is sort of what you'd expect. But there's a point at which we, even though we're shaking this substrate with 10 to the seven Gs of acceleration, we were worried we might be launching these particles with really, really high velocities all the way down to the high vacuum regime. In fact, uh, we get a fairly big tail of particles that come off with, uh, with velocity near, near rest from the surface which really opens up the possibility of using optical forces to sort of slow down the particles that are launched from our method uh, using, using a slowing uh, laser. So, um, so in particular, we have uh, uh, particles that are falling uh, up against a, 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 a vertical beam in this case that we, where we can show um, basically there's a, there, we can slow down the velocity of the particle uh, using that vertical laser, even though we're in vacuum and this in principle combined with uh, feedback cooling would allow us to directly load the particles and recapture them in, in high vacuum. And so this is a movie kind of showing when we have the beam off versus on, you can see that in this case, it's about a factor or two or something uh, speed difference, but we can kind of tune that and you can even flip the particles and make them go backwards if you, if you turn enough intensity up. So this looks somewhat promising and I think could be a nice tool uh, for these matter wave experiments if we can get it to work. Uh, well, okay, so um, so I'm kind of running out of time here, but I wanted to, in the last sort of 10 minutes or so, talk about another, what I think is a very exciting gravitational related uh, application of these sensors that also touches on uh, dark matter as I advertise in the title. And so uh, gravitational waves, I think are a really hot topic now. It's very exciting that we can figure out that gravitational waves actually can be measured on the earth. Uh, and so the LIGO interferometers have been doing a fantastic job at discovering all kinds of new things like binary black holes and neutron star and spirals and so forth. And so our, um, uh, if we look at sort of the frequency landscape for gravitational waves, LIGO has been measuring kind of at the kind of 100 Hertz to few few tens of Hertz to say kilohertz sort of, sort of range, which is relatively high frequency on, on this landscape. And below that frequency, there are ideas for things like space-based detectors, LISA. Uh, below that, these pulse, pulsar timing arrays are, are, are doing measurements. But um, above the LIGO frequency band, there hasn't really been any sort of uh, technology for systematically studying gravitational waves at higher frequency. And so that's where we think these levitated sensors uh, can play some role. And now the sources here uh, for these higher frequency gravitational waves above say 10 kilohertz uh, tend to be more uh, beyond the standard model or possibly dark matter uh, related signals from example, things like axions or primordial uh, black holes of, of certain sizes. And so the idea is that you can make a particle uh, suspended in an optical cavity into a gravitational wave detector kind of like an optical version of Joe Weber's aluminum bar detector. So then this bar detector, uh, gravitational wave basically causes an excitation in the aluminum bar. It rings like a bell and then it's a high Q resonance. You try to measure at this one frequency to see how much the bar is changing its displacement. So in our case, you have an optical cavity and you suspend a particle in it. Now the gravitational wave will change the physical distance between the mirrors in the cavity. And what that amounts to is essentially displacing the antinode of the standing wave holding the particle uh, from its equilibrium position. And so this, this causes a kick on the particle, which causes it to ring up into some oscillation inside the optical trap. So it's kind of like the optical trap analog of this uh, bar detector. And so because these are really high Q, high force sensitivity detectors, even though they're not very massive, you can get pretty good strain sensitivity. Uh, so for example, with a 10 meter cavity, strains like 10 to the minus 22 uh, per root hertz are accessible at, at say 100 uh, kilohertz frequencies. So, so these things uh, are, are giving quite, quite impressive strain sensitivity, but really only at the higher uh, frequency end. So it's not sort of going to compete with LIGO, but rather could extend LIGO's range into the higher frequency band. And the reason for that is that the, the um, 
what, the reason it does better is that it's limited by a different noise source with a different frequency scaling. So whereas the LIGO sensors tend to be limited by laser shot noise, uh, this sensor is limited by the thermal uh, Brownian motion of the particle as it's uh, kicked around in the trap. And so this noise actually gets better at high frequency, uh, whereas LIGO sensitivity tends to get worse. And so we're building now uh, a um, one meter prototype uh, of this detector where we have a Michelson interferometer being set up on an on optical table. So the idea is that the gravitational wave will come along and stretch and squeeze space time around it and there'll be some uh, perturbation on the uh, a force acting on these two sensors one that are trapped in these different arms of the Michelson. Uh, we have a collaboration uh, with Peter Barker's group to investigate possibly implementing a fiber based uh, version of this, assuming we can keep the noise uh, in the fiber uh, at, at bay at these kind of 100 kilohertz type frequencies. Andy, so, can I ask about this? Yeah, sorry. I, yeah, just really quick. So, I, um, it's a simple question, but I, it's, it's driven me crazy ever since I read this paper. What really does the bead buy you? In the sense that like I, that picture you have right now is LIGO, but with two beads stuck in the middle of it. So like- <laughs> Yeah, you... yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so the, our cavities are, are much shorter than LIGO first off. So if we were just measuring the same thing that they were, we'd be doing pretty poorly, right? You could, you could see that right off the bat, right? So, so the bead is really giving you something. And the answer is that the, um, the, the limitation on measuring the gravitational waves effect on the bead is being set by the thermal noise on the bead and not by the uh, the shot noise limited displacement measurement of the mirror's length. So LIGO is directly doing a length measurement. They want to know how long is my cavity and by what did it length, by what did the length change? And so that has some limit due to just discrete photon statistics, right? Uh, at high frequency in particular. Um, and so in our case, uh, the um, we've sort of turned the problem around and turned it into a force problem rather than a displacement problem. So the particle we have is a pretty high Q oscillator. So watching it move isn't the problem. We can see where it moves, but it's getting acted on by these random thermal forces. And so we have to be able to discern the effect of the gravitational wave on top of those thermal forces, as opposed to the problem of being able to see the displacement of it in the first place. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks. Okay, sure. Um, Okay, so so then, as I was saying, uh, dark matter actually might be the, the area here to, to really look at with this kind of a sensor. So we there's pretty strong evidence for it around us for for being there, including things like lensing, rotation curve, structure formation, CMB, for example. And so so it's out there. The question is, what is it made of? And so there are many different possibilities. Whether it could be sort of wave-like or particle-like, uh, one one. Uh, theory is uh, is that it could be axions, so this would be a light uh, wave-like uh, part of wave-like uh, dark matter candidate that would explain the strong CP problem in in particle physics. So it sort of has two two birds with one stone, so it has a good reason to exist. Uh, dark matter could be something like WIMPs. In this case, our detector, at least as we're building it now, wouldn't be sensitive to it, but we could also detect some component of dark matter, for example, from primordial black holes if you had in spirals of uh, subsolar mass black holes, we could get uh, some sort of free, uh, gravitational waves in this uh, band above 10 kilohertz where we're, where we're sensitive. And so here's a, a plot from, a, we just put a new paper on the archive earlier this week, uh, estimating the sensitivity for different uh, signals from uh, dark matter candidates, including axions and primordial black holes. And so these are the sensitivity curves for the detector in terms of strain versus frequency. As the frequency gets higher, our strain sensitivity actually improves. At some point, we'll need too much laser power that we might start melting the sensor. So we, we cut this off at a, estimating around 300 kilohertz or so. But it's pretty sensitive still between 10 kilohertz and a few hundred uh, kilohertz. And uh, so the, the band here in pink would be primordial black hole mergers at a tenth of a solar mass at a, at a kiloparsec. And this area over here would be predictions from axion annihilation around black holes within the Milky Way. So the idea being that you have uh, axion clouds that can form through something called the Penrose superradiance process. So these axions can make clouds around spinning black holes and uh, and then produce a monochromatic source of gravitational waves where the, the gravitational wave frequency would just be basically twice the uh, 
axion mass from the annihilation. And so if you have a gut scale axion, you know, at the grand unified scale, that, that frequency is naturally kind of around 100 kilohertz. So it sort of falls into the sensitivity band of this detector. So if we have gut scale axions, there might be a potential for seeing those kind of signals from their annihilation within, within the galactic range, kind of at the 10 kiloparsec uh, range, depending on the size of the sensor that, you, that you're running. Um, and then going forward, then maybe even this could uh, be part of the vision for the future of gravitational wave astronomy, uh, where maybe you'd have uh, a set of these sort of compact detectors uh, stationed in a few different locations around the world, and that would maybe give us good coverage into this higher frequency band for, for gravitational waves. Okay, so I'm kind of running out of time here. I think I'll conclude. So I talked about several uh, gravitational tests that are all relying on levitated optomechanics. In particular, in sort of the classical regime, we can still look at, quote, quantum gravity effects from string theory, uh, where the sensor itself is classical. And by just looking at these kind of micron scale uh, gravitational tests, uh, the gravitational waves, I think, are an interesting possibility for looking forward as well. And then in the quantum regime, if we can really demonstrate matter wave properties with nanoparticles, one can not only do uh, improvements on these micron scale tests, but also I think uh, if we maybe work together as a community, think about ways of uh, in pushing the technology really to the point where we can really test uh, whether um, gravity is doing something and entangling uh, quantum superpositions of, of particles. And then also testing whether gravity might have some role in decohering uh, macroscopic superpositions in some, in some fundamental way, which I think is another interesting thing to, to explore. So with that, I just wanted to acknowledge our uh, group and some of the people actually doing the work and our collaborators. And thanks everybody for your attention. So, yeah. So let us give uh, thanks to Andrew and then we'll proceed for questions. Um, I think the best way to ask questions is just unmute yourself and ask the questions. If you want to raise hands and ask, then I'm, I'm, I'm trying to watch that, but, but just free feel to unmute and ask the questions. Andy, can I ask you a question? Sure, yeah. yeah. Can you go back to your new slide there where you had, uh, you know, where you're describing these limits in, uh, you know, you had like, 80 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz. Yeah, this one. This guy, well, yeah. Can you, can you explain that diagram a little more? Yeah, so this is a new, um, it's a, a new analysis uh, for theoretical sources that we've done. Now that we're actually building a one meter instrument, we've done a little bit more refined source modeling mm -hmm. for signals from axions, for example, and uh, black hole, uh, and primordial black hole uh, mergers. And so, so the blue band here are signals from different super radiance levels of this basically levels of, you can think about this sort of as a gravitational atom in the sky, if you want, where gravity is like, you know, binding the axions around the black hole. And so the axion being its own antiparticle can annihilate with itself and produce a gravitational wave. And so, so for a one solar mass black hole, we have this sort of boundary for a three solar mass black hole, we have that sort of boundary. So this is what you'd expect for integrated strain of 10 to the six seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, from those signals. And the, and the lifetime can be much longer than that, depending on the, 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 the black hole conditions. Uh, the, and and the, you, you sort of meant you got one meter disk, one meter stack. Oh, yes. Yeah. So this is explained. I did. I kind of went over that really quick. This is explained in the uh, in the archive paper that we just put out. But and we might have talked about this a, in, privately before, but we were talking about to make the sensitivity of this system better, we want a higher mass levitated particle. So one approach to doing that is to not have a, a, a spherical particle, but rather a disc shaped particle. That allows me to put more mass in the standing wave and also gives me a favorable property. But, but you're talking about like the disc is small, but the, the length is the length of the cavity. Is that right? Yes, the length is the length of the cavity. That's right. That's right. That's right. We're that's not that's suspending a one meter disc. But then the, the stack right. idea is a is the idea of uh, basically you extending the length of the of the disc by a bit. Um, so to get something that's more kind of 10 microns instead of a less than a micron thick right. by putting a, a dielectric stack coating, basically, yeah. if you put high index 
kind of end caps on the disc. It's still it's still a disc geometry, but you can get a little bit thicker disc trapped. We we were able to determine no, I got and, it. and still have the photon recoil properties uh, from from the uh, scattering look reasonably good. So we did some numerical work on that, and that's what's in the that right. archive paper. But so it's a way of getting a little boost in mass essentially uh, by by using a, a thicker, a more massive object. But it's still, I would argue, a lot less massive than the LIGO end mirror. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, okay, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, so I think there were a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Um, I think uh, Animesh had one and then uh, Matt uh, had another one. I think Anupam gave some answer to Animesh, but anyway, I'll, I'll let Animesh ask and then perhaps Matt ask. And I was just asking that you motivated the action via the QCD problem. Were there not some, I may be wrong on this, but was there not some evidence that that has been ruled out at least in the heavy mass regime or something like that? Um, yeah, so there's sort of a, there's sort of an allowed window, if you like, for the, for the uh, mass of the QCD axion. So we know the QCD axion can't be heavier than about six milli electron volts due to the supernova bounds. Uh, but there's sort of a range between about six milli electron volts and uh, and micro electron volts where where the axion uh, mass could be. Uh, the lower bound on the axion mass is actually depending on cosmology. So whether uh, you have a high energy scale of inflation compared to the PQ uh, phase transition, so the the, the um, axion decay constant, whether it's higher or lower than the energy scale of inflation determine something about the lower bound of the of the axion mass. So for kind of the typical cosmology, we have a high energy scale of inflation, you have the traditional axion window, which is like one micro EV to, to a few milli EV. And in the, uh, if you if you have a different uh, energy scale of inflation, then the axion could be much lighter. It could be gut scale, for example, uh, with F axion, and then, and then the mass of the axion would be more like nano EV all the way down to even lower than that. So, so there, there's still actually a fairly amount of uh, allowed parameter space for the QCD axion mass. So, so there was also some question regarding a vacuum. So, so what is the best kind of vacuum you can uh, do? While you, you, I think you touched upon by where you're trying to get better loading in vacuum, but can you say something about? Yeah, so we, we haven't spent uh, a lot of experimental effort yet on really improving the vacuum in our experiments, primarily because we've been limited by things like technical noise and the lasers and other sort of noise sources, which would basically give us the same sensitivity, you know, whether we improved our vacuum or not. But I think in the nanoparticle interference experiments, uh, then having a better vacuum is going to be even more important. And so um, we have been running, you know, without baking, in the mid minus seven range is about as good vacuum as we need. We ten, ten, mid ten minus seven tor range. Uh, I think you could do better in baking. We haven't actually done too much effort on that in our group, but we are, as I think I mentioned offline earlier, uh, working on developing a cryogenic system now, which in principle should give even much much lower pressures uh, if we're able to get that off the ground. Okay. Yeah. Um, our. Are there um, some other uh, questions? Uh, yeah, just ple please feel free to yeah. unmute and ask. Uh, okay, can, can I you hear? Oh. Yeah. Okay. I think there are two people, so just go in sequence. Um, Hello, can I ask the question? Okay, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, um, in the experiment uh, with um, entanglement by gravity, uh, do you have, do you, um, do you really uh, do the experiment? And if you do, uh, can you put a sort of a, a upper limit or lower limit? I don't know, with respect to... Uh, yeah, I mean, so this is something that we're, we're very interested in, in developing. I mean, there, there are a lot of technical things that I think we still need to solve and figure out before we're able to actually do this experiment, but the the idea would be to be in the regime where the phase shift from gravity is actually the measurable thing here that's going to cause the entanglement, right? So we want to be able to see a large enough interaction where we can generate some phase between these two systems where, where we can actually measure that it's gravity and not some other background effect uh, that's that's actually causing the, the two systems to be entangled. So, so I think it's still a ways off in terms of, uh, you know, 
possibility for the lab, but I, but I think it's, it's probably possible. It's just, it's going to take a few years to get some of the technical things figured out, but, but it's not really, I think for me, it's most interesting if we can actually get into that regime where we're actually measuring it in terms of setting a separate limit. But on the, on the other hand, being able to set limits on gravitational based sources of decoherence in quantum superpositions, I think is interesting as well. And there you're testing kind of new theories as opposed to just trying to measure the gravitational interaction at its predicted strength. Yes, sure. Okay, and thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I, I think there was another question. Yeah. Yes, I had a question here. Hi, uh, Andrew. This is Steven from, from University of Groningen. Um, thank you for your talk. We're also running a uh, nanosphere trapping uh, uh, experiment here. So it was nice to, uh, to, to hear from you. Um, and one of the things indeed I, I find limiting is, is kind of loading efficiency and consistency of the particle. So it was interesting to find your uh, kind of uh, vacuum loading, loading technique. So you showed in principle how that works, but I did not really see. So, so could you say a bit more what the current status is? How well does it work? Do you currently implement that or? Yeah, so we actually have now uh, four different nanoparticle trapping experiments that are all running at the same time. And mm -hmm. at, in, originally we were using a combination of a nebulizer loading method Right. as well as these other shaking uh, particle methods. Now all the systems only use the shaking method. And so it's been pretty pretty efficient. And so we've gotten particles as small as uh, 85 nanometer radius trappable. And so it, it takes us something like maybe 10, 15 seconds or something like that to catch the particle as long as the thing is working reasonably well. So, so yeah, it's reproducible. We've made several of them. And so we're, we're much happier with this than the nebulizer because then of course you had to really pump out from some high pressure, there's moisture yeah. in the vacuum. But what we haven't done yet and what we're still trying to do is the UHV getting that part really perfected. Yeah. If we can really do it without pumping out, because even going from, you know, from two tour down to vacuum takes a half an hour or something, right? Whereas, yeah. whereas if I could really start at 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six, we'd be pretty happy. But I think that the, the numbers look pretty encouraging. So I, I think eventually we may be able to do that using this, using this launcher because the speed of the particles falling uh, is not as scary as we, as we were uh, expecting. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, we tried this uh, nebulizer method and indeed I'll probably get in touch with you uh, to learn a bit about the shaking uh, method and uh, offline. Sure, yeah, it's basically a ultrasonic cleaner uh, right. piezo that we, we buy a commercial cleaner piezo and we built our own pulse power generator. It puts about half a kilowatt wow. of power into it. And, wow. and, yeah, it's, it's a pretty heavy duty thing. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Um, I have one more, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Um, so there was some back and forth on the archive I saw about low frequency acceleration noise in this experiment. Um, I was curious uh, what you guys think is the conclusion of all that. Yeah, maybe, I don't know if Sugato is the best to respond to that one. Um, uh, in this one, ah, okay, okay, no, so we wrote a, we wrote a, yeah, so hello, Dan, by the way. Uh, we, we kind of wrote a rejoinder to that um, in, the, in the sense that if you have both these happening in free fall, you know, then only the relative acceleration noise matters. And in that case, uh, it's much more uh, lenient. You know, you, you need to keep some five meter distance from people and 10 meters from traffic and stuff like that. I think maybe one could add that the best thing will be to do this kind of experiment underground in a free fall and uh, where your seismic noise is also very small. Yeah. So, and I have a, uh, you know, keep a five meter exclusion zone, so, which is not uh, impossible. In, in, in principle, one can also do in Bremen's drop tower, but the problem is that to maintaining that exclusion zone is harder. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, yep. Yeah. yeah. Vibration is also important for the other nanosphere acceleration measurements too, right? So it's a, it's going to be a common problem to... The assumption a... tells us that at the end of the day, if we want to do this experiment of quantum gravity, testing quantum gravity, then, uh, you know, we would need uh, quite a lot of infrastructure. That's what it uh, highlights. Yeah. And, and even if I may add, even large mass superpositions, if you are to do long distance large mass, this, this acceleration noise is not just specific to the entanglement, it is, it is also generally for a superposition deleterious. So, so yeah, one way is to let it free fall, which gets rid of most of the things, 
but we are um, i mean th this is the price you have to pay um, to you know and then 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 some some exclusion so i think even some people ask me this question whether you can do it in iss even iss cannot do that because if you go to iss uh, the the local g is something like 10 raised to minus 3 times but in a drop tower you can reach even better 10 raised to minus 6 yeah i mean on earth yeah so, i guess i just i know a little bit about these um you know, matter wave gravitational detectors at low frequency and, you know, those are free falling objects and they are still limited in my understanding um, by Newtonian gradients, Absolutely. you know, just from yeah. the yeah. clouds. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So then, so the Newtonian gradients are the only ones which are left in the end because it's gradient and that, that is the only thing which doesn't free fall doesn't solve for, for that. We need this exclusion zone. So gotcha. uh, yeah. yeah. Also in the interferometer experiments, they, the atom interferometer, they, they often have, approaches to try to measure the gradient characterize it by running at different heights and sort of get yeah. a better way of trying to subtract it out but yeah that's right that's definitely I mean, going to be an issue would be fabulous. And, another way yeah so we haven't studied that way yet with other other uh, meters and things like that but uh, but but yeah so the the, the the interesting thing is that the exclusion zone is not extraordinary you know it's just five very very modest uh, you know five meters ten meters so I think uh, if you are very lucky, well, which we, we will not be, will never be perhaps in this circumstance. I mean, you can put it in uh, Lisa. Then you are in a remarkably <laughs> comfort zone. Well, that, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so in 15 years time, perhaps you will not be able to get such a large uh, macroscopic superposition, but maybe who knows, there will be well, next. Well, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, thanks guys. Nice to see everybody. Right, right. Yeah, um, good to see you. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Andy, I had a general uh, question. So, the, so you are in, in most cases, uh, you are doing um, force sensing rather than acceleration sensing, right? Yeah, that's the way I usually look at it, right? Yeah. Uh, and in practice, in terms of measurement, what's the difference? Are you still measuring a displacement or, or, well, or this kind of uh, hoppy? Yeah, I mean, we are measuring a displacement. And in, in some say, you could say, you know, because we're measuring displacement, you can figure out there's some acceleration. I think it, it's a question of, you know, if you have a, uh, so an example would be like, for example, with the nanoparticle interference experiment there, I think the right language would be to you'd say you're doing an acceleration, right? Because the mass of your particle drops out of the, of the thing you're, you're measuring. But when you're limited by thermal Brownian noise, you know, you have the mass actually appearing in your sensitivity, your force sensitivity limit. I like to think about it as a force measurement. There you have the gravitational thing is sourced by the mass and the mass your sensor is also coming into your, your thermal noise limit, right? So so I think I like it, it's sort of more natural to talk about it as a force measurement. You can cast it in terms of acceleration sensitivity. And on that one graph I showed, I had kind of both lines there, right? It's force and acceleration. Mm. So, but is there a, so when we, if, um, say, if, if we are measuring a force through an interferometer and effectively we are measuring an ac acceleration. Yes, I think it's probably more natural. In yeah, yeah. Is there still an advantage over an atom in the sense that this thermal, th thermal noise, is it like going one by, the, you know, going in the other way with the mass, like less for the larger? So, mass? yeah. So in my view, the main advantage you get in the interferometer using a nanoparticle over an atom is is the localization. So the idea is that if you have an atom interferometer, the wave packet of the atom spreads out over some scale determined by the mass of the atom. The mass of the atom is fairly light. Uh, if you do a nanoparticle interferometer, now the mass of the particle itself is substantially heavier. And so the wave packet won't expand as much. So you can keep it localized on micron scales for second time scales. And so if you wanted to do a precision measurement, for example, near a surface, measure Casimir or measure some interaction with some other nearby object, you can keep it very well localized over a longer measurement duration than you can in an atom interferometer. So it's not really a sensitivity win so much that I would claim we'd get, but rather just a localization win. So Andy, I have a question regarding this uh, Casimir uh, expression that you had shown in your slide. Yeah, yeah. So, um, see if I can find there, it. But, uh, for um, in the case of vacuum, if I if I am not wrong, so this is a zero temperature limit. Am I correct? This is at zero temperature. That's right. And so the question is, at what point do temperatures uh, play a role? Typically, the thermal blackbody wavelength is a relevant length scale. So at room temperature, it's about seven microns. So if you're longer than that, then you expect to see thermal effects. 
but it depends on the temperature, right? So you would say that if I cool down the system, then perhaps. Uh, um, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see experiments at a few microns length scale as a function of temperature. And that's something that we're interested in, in studying in, in our new system where we, we hope to have cryogenic capability of the surface. Okay, I see. But suppose if I shine a laser, there's a non adiabatic change in temperature. What would ah, so you see some discrete. Um, yeah, I mean, it may be possible to see a, uh, you have to disentangle that from whatever other perturbations uh, the laser does, I guess, right? What I was thinking because Transients or something. To our own experiment, um, um, we are thinking, um, with Andy's, of course, with a part of it. So say for instance, um, we are taking electronic spin and then we are converting that into nuclear spin by shining some laser beam. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say that uh, in the, in the vacuum which we are operating, maybe the zero temperature limit is a fairly good approximation. But as soon as I shine the laser beam, um, you know, what happens? It's non adiabatic change in the, you know, temperature in some sense. Yeah, I mean, I think you'll modulate the Casimir force at some level, mm -hmm. um, you know, as soon as, and the time scale, I guess, of the heating would be my naive thought there. I'd have to think a little more about it probably to see. But, but the idea of having a signal that you can modulate is a good thing in general, right? In these experiments, in particular, also in these gravity experiments, if you have some background, you can tune by turning a knob. So if we could controllably adjust the Casimir, for example, we could maybe subtract it out better on, on other, on top of other things. So it's a, I think it's, it's, it might be useful in these uh, um, entanglement tests too, as a handle to make sure what you're seeing is not from some thermal effect or Casimir effect or some other effect, or, right? Thanks, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. If um, there are, are there any? If, no other questions, but please feel free to unmute and ask more, or, or even I guess if one can email Andy. Yeah. And we should also thank all all people who joined us today, and and indeed, of course, uh, a great thanks to Andy for uh, you know, stimulating talk. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for organizing. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, we can we can perhaps um, continue for, for I mean, depend, I mean, we must be quite tired, but we can continue a little bit more uh, after stopping the recording. Uh, 